episode number 20 of the Hybrid Athlete Podcast. Uh, it's been a while since I jumped on here and just kind of uh, chopped it up a little bit about what I got going on in my uh, in my fitness uh, journey and my path so far this year. But uh, as I said in one of the previous episodes, I'm just looking forward to continuing to report to you. Um, anyone who follows me, I think I got like 67, 68 subscribers now, so that's awesome. Um, you know, I just basically just post my physique updates, you know, basically kind of me just checking in, posing, like showing kind of my my how my body changes like physically over time. Um, you know, I was looking at them the other day, like, you know, I have a couple of those shorts to where I'm basically, you know, just kind of posing the same way front side, you know, side bicep, rear double, you know, double, uh, basically double flex. I forget what the bodybuilding name is for it. Uh, I think it's just like, uh, well, 90 degree rotation, you know, just kind of showing every, every angle and showing how my body's changing and getting, getting larger through the winter and then smaller through the spring and summer. So it's been kind of cool to like kind of see the evolution of how I've changed from basically weighing 195, you know, back in December at around Christmas, relatively lean, but now I'm, you know, pretty lean, you know, body fat wise, I'm probably around 10% body fat, I'd say, um, you know, at least 10%. Um, weighing about 182, 183. So I woke up fasted. I went for 18 mile run this morning and my body weight is 183.6. Um, so that's, you know, three pounds heavier basically than what I was last year. Um, and this basically is a report on what uh, my training plan is for this taper week going into the full marathon uh, on May 5th, as well as kind of a recap because a lot's happened since I came on here and uh, reported uh, kind of gave uh, an episode, uh, I think about six to seven weeks ago, something like that. I think right around the time I finished that uh, that half marathon in March. Um, so just to start the report, um, I'll just kind of dig into to basically what, what's been going on with me uh, with these races and stuff. And I do feel very satisfied in my effort more than I did pre the previous year. Um, what I mean by that is basically this whole off season, I was pushing the food. I was eating a lot, staying lean though, like, you know, working, basically eating the same, like eating consistent, eating healthy, no cheat meals, nothing like that. But I put on 17 to 18 pounds at least basically since my Ironman race last year in June. So, you know, the, the backward kind of review, the, the retroactive view of that was 2023 second half put on about 18 pounds, maybe for the first month in 2024, sustain that. Um, I did like a, basically like a CrossFit style competition in Frederick with uh, Sarah's Fitness on June, uh, January 20th. Um, that went pretty well. I think I got like fourth or fifth place out of, uh, you know, 20 to 30 competitive guys that do that. So I was satisfied with that. I mean, that's kind of, you know, kind of a litmus test of where I'm at in terms of like, okay, holding on to my strength, but cardio is starting to kind of, you know, take over the training and stuff. And, um, you know, I've probably said it half a dozen times on these episodes. It's, it's a sliding scale of your efforts, right? Like you start out, if you want to put on weight, you're not going to be running 30 to 40 miles a week, vice versa. If you want to, if you don't want to put on weight, um, if, and you want to slim down, you are going to be running 30 to 40 miles a week. It doesn't really matter. You know, it matters how much you eat, but it really matters in terms of getting a stimulus and a response. Your training style is really a big indicator. You know, a guy that does Ironman is professionally weighs 155 pounds, eats sometimes more than a guy that weighs 290 pounds in the off season and is a professional bodybuilder like, you know, Nick Walker or someone like those guys, uh, you know, that basically are five, six, five, seven. But they, you know, they eat 5,000 calories a day in the off season and they do minimal cardio. So that's why they look that way. So the type of training really, really does matter. It matters just as much or even more as nutrition, because the whole the whole saying is you can't outwork a bad diet, but also like you can't train. You can't train like a beast in one area and expect to grow or may stay the same in another area. Like I just I feel really good about my run this morning. But my bench press is going down. I just feel it like I know it. Like I'm going to go hit the weights tomorrow after this 18 mile run today. And I just know like my bench press is not the same as it was in November. It's a give and take. Um, but that being said, like the efforts there, um, like I said, you know, a few minutes ago, the effort was there. Like I did two a day workouts with the weights this off season. I stayed on my cardio throughout the off season. Like a lot of times in you know October, November, a hybrid athlete like myself is basically running 10 to 12 miles a week still. Like I'll do a 5k run, you know, just to kind of warm up before I hit the weights, large, smaller muscle group. If I'm doing leg day, it's like a 10 minute bike to warm up. That's it. And I'm hitting legs, like everything, deadlift, squat, you know, even kind of clean, sometimes clean press, whatever it is. So that's a different story. But basically to summarize, um, I think I put myself in a great position to beat my time from last year in the marathon. Um, my, pre my times in the both half marathons leading up to this indicate that. 
So in my first half marathon last year, which was on March 3rd of 2023, I basically had to stop and go at the end of the race. So I got like an hour and 36, hour 37 minutes, I think, unofficial time. So that wasn't, that wasn't, I was, was not satisfied with that. On March 3rd, I wouldn't expect to be, you know, finishing sub one hour 30 or sub an hour 32. Um, but I did fail to complete it in its entirety. So this year, basically I did the, a half marathon a little bit later on March 24th. But I had about the same training phase, basically, if that makes sense. Like my prep was that for that race was like four to five weeks coming out of like, you know, six months of doing 10 to 12 miles a week, not really training for any racing. But basically, it's a quick turnaround for me. I jump on the calendar and I say, all right, I'm going to run X amount of miles starting in February. And I do it and I execute it. But what happened this year was a good outcome. I basically did the race a little bit later, two weeks later, to be exact. But the outcome was favorable because I got I ran hour 35, 40, I think, or an hour 35, 30. So and I still weighed like around 190 pounds at that time. So my weight was dropping. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But basically going from that first race to this next half marathon, which happened on April 15th, my weight kept dropping and my time also dropped. So I make benchmark comparisons and I encourage people who are hybrid athletes to do this. You know, if you're a guy that's like, well, I want to run a race, I want to run a marathon at this weight. Like it's important to set weight related goals, but it's also important to set like performance related goals at the same weight because like pound for pound, there's a reason the UFC has a pound for pound, you know, the best fighter in the UFC. That's pretty good bragging rights, right? Like if you're 180 pounds and you could bench press 550 pounds, that's a lot more impressive than the guy that weighs 380 pounds and bench presses 605 pounds. So, you know, you want to compare apples to apples in this. And that's what I do with my training as a hybrid athlete is I basically go into the realm of, okay, I know last year I did the same race, the horse tooth half marathon last year. And last year, I believe I got an hour 35, 42. This year I got an hour 33, 14 or something. I think it was an hour 33, 14 unofficial um, time, uh, but that's my chip time. So basically I beat my time by two and a half minutes. Now that is very, you know, satisfying to me because I weigh more, but I'm getting a better race time. So I'm heavier when I do the race in April, but my output, like my time is two minutes better. Now, you know, some basic math, if you extend that to a full marathon, that's four minute time difference. I missed qualifying for Boston last year by four hour, four minutes and 12 seconds, I believe. So basically what's happening is, is like I'm bridging the gap between like a, a long-term goal I have, which is to run a sub three hour marathon. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily going to happen this year, but I think my odds of doing that, my chances of doing that are much greater due to the fact that my two half marathons leading up were kind of the litmus test and I've passed those and I've made improvements, time, time, time improvements, as well as strength gains in the off season. So I think that's really what you want to see as a hybrid athlete is you want to see strength go up and run time improvements. And that's a challenge because the heavier you get, the harder it is to run long distance. Um, but I think that I've done a pretty, pretty damn good job at it so far and kind of dedicating at least two years to it. You know, um, in 2021, I made a decision to stop drinking alcohol, which was probably the best decision so far of my adult life. Um, you know, basically first would be that. And second would be changing career paths and becoming a data professional. Cause now I have time to, you know, sit, record these podcasts, spend time with my family, um, you know, train whenever you know, train at the hours I want, you know, um, you know, training the after, training the evening, um, train early in the morning. Uh, I don't have to be at, at work till eight. I usually start at 6am anyways, if I'm not working out in the morning, but basically that flexibility is awesome too. Um, but bottom line is, you know, this, this, um, training, basically this training, um, time for me, this training, these training sessions, these kind of meso cycles, right? These six to eight week cycles, there've been basically two of them leading up to prep for this full marathon. Phase one for me going into the racy endurance season is get out of the, get your body adapted. The adaptation phase is tough. Um, anyone who doesn't lift as much as I do and simply wants to be in better cardiovascular state knows those runs suck. The first time you try to run six miles even is a pain. And then the set, you know, you try to go to eight, nine miles, like it can be a bitch to finish that distance. But if you do it once and you become acclimated and adapted, you don't worry about time. It's important to have those runs to where you don't care about when you finish, you care that you finish without stopping. Without stopping is key because, you know, there are a lot of Ironman athletes will tell you this. Once you stop, it's just different. It's not the same. You can try to stop and start, but, you know, stopping really just fucks everything up. So bottom line, 
do those long runs to where you want you want to be able to finish. You don't care about time. And that's basically what session, what phase one for me is. If I could break down the endurance season into two phases, that's phase one is basically get acclimated. Like my training mileage looks something like this, something like the following. And let me know if you if anyone who has any input, please comment below, like what if you agree with this or not. But if I'm going to run a half marathon, the first one I run, it's like a four to six week training, training, basically training a regimen. I run at least one 12 mile run every week. So the, that's usually on a Wednesday. And I'm still lifting weights four or five days a week. But the weight intensity goes down, the volume, the weights themselves, each 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 uh, rep and set goes down. But we're talking just about running. So basically on a Wednesday, I would do a 12 mile run. And then I turn around on a Saturday and do like a, probably a seven, seven and a half mile run. So those are my two long days and prep for a half marathon. And then in between the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, I'm still running. So like it'll be like a three to four mile run on Monday, on Monday, two and a half, maybe the light, a light run on Tuesday. So three mile run, two and a half mile run, 12 mile run. And then basically the next day might be more like hit cardio, like boxing or just like a two mile run or even a 20, 25 minute bike ride, something like that. And then I go Friday, a little bit lighter cardio from a cardio perspective, but I hit it again, seven and a half miles, you know, at least on Saturday. And then basically your total mileage, you're looking at, you know, twice the distance of a half marathon, probably at least 26 miles for that week in total training volume. And I think that's a good kind of ratio to keep, um, you know, for anyone who's, who's starting out or anyone who's in decent shape and wants to do a half marathon. Um, I would follow that regimen, that kind of training volume is basically, um, you know, run at least four or five days a week, maybe even six, um, but definitely have at least like a long day and one, uh, one day that's close to being your longest day. And then just kind of in between kind of get a feel for it. You know, um, it's nice to have shorter runs that basically increase intensity. Like one thing I did this year versus last year was if I'm going to run only 15 minutes on a treadmill, I used to run at nine miles an hour. Right. But now I run at 9.5 or 10 miles an hour. So I'm running six minute miles for 15 minutes on a light day for me. Now, people might not think that that's light, but that's where kind of progressive overload comes in from a cardio from an endurance training perspective. Like guys that run that fast for an entire marathon that are damn near winning them, they do, they are basically able to sustain that because they don't start out. There's a way to get there. Right. It's either it's just like weightlifting. It's either run longer and don't care about how fast you go or run fast and don't care about how long you go. So I do both and that during the adaptation phase for me, phase one, right, that we're talking about, that has really driven some more performance for me. And performance meaning like, you know, two to two and a half minutes improvement on a half marathon time for me is a big deal, especially when you combine a three pound weight increase. And I think I'm just as lean. I mean, I, I'll, you know, I always keep a bunch of photos of myself, you know, taking pictures and I, I post those shorts on my channel at the same kind of the same spot in my bathroom with like, you know, like the kind of the blank, just that sliding door in the background, like, so I can see, and anyone who follows me can see, all right, this guy's doing, this guy knows what he's doing. Like he's, you can definitely see a stark difference between, you know, and I post comments on them, like 195 pounds around Christmas. And now I'm like 182, 183. Like I said, I woke up fasted. I not completely fasted, but I mean, you know, I had a big meal the night before, but I didn't eat anything before I ran. I, I had like half a banana and like a scoop of peanut butter and a bunch of caffeine. And that was it this morning. But basically I weigh 130, 183.6 pounds fasted and after an 18 mile run where I lost a lot of fluids. So probably when I'm carved up and when I'm well rested in the evening, I weigh 187, 188 because my weight will fluctuate. Bodybuilders, for example, like their weight fluctuates eight to 10 pounds a day, depending, depending on when they take, they get their weight um, on the scale. So, um, yeah, what I'm trying to say is uh, like that the volume is kind of lined up and the intensity, varying intensity from a cardiovascular perspective has lined up to basically me making some good improvements and building some confidence, um, which is great because now I feel like I have a good shot at, you know, hitting. If I don't hit three hours, I might hit 302, at least break 303, which would be great because I feel healthy. I feel strong. So, um, you know, I don't feel, for example, like this this morning I hit the 18 mile run. In about two hours, nine minutes, two hours, 10. So that's basically like a, a seven minute, three, seven minute, five second pace, um, which is pretty much what I ran last year's marathon at. Uh, but I take two things into account. This marathon in Colorado and Fort Collins is net downhill, especially for the first 13 miles. So it's expected of me that I break an hour 30 in the first half marathon because it's net uh, downhill, like, I don't know, a thousand feet or something, something crazy. 
Um, and then we hit like a big hill at mile 17. So, you know, that's kind of something to, to be prepared for. But um, bottom line is like the path, the, the, the paths that I run when I'm training, they're challenging. Like there's a series of hills, like it's a lot of elevation gain, gain and change, like basically gain and loss in elevation over the course of that distance plays a role. It, it plays a big difference as opposed to just running flat. As I would argue that running flat, if the net gain from start to finish is zero, but one of the one of the courses is completely flat, like just straight flat, like Kansas or Nebraska or something. I mean, that would be easier than to basically gain 500, lose 500, gain 500, lose 500, and then do that three or four times and then run the same distance. Yeah, net is zero, but you added in, I mean, it's a lot, it's just simple math. It's like physics. I'm sure there's some, you know, some physics equation that can explain that and kind of quantify it. But uh, what I'm, basically what I'm getting at is that I, I've chosen and I've measured training courses for me in my city and just on the streets and basically on desirable paths where I don't hit traffic lights and stuff to where I can consistently train and push myself and use benchmarks to basically measure my performance. Now, what I'm going to get into is phase two of training. And phase two of training was a different ball game for me this year. Last year, I wasn't lifting as intense of weights throughout my entire marathon prep. Last year, I'd take a full day off. I'd maybe do light weights. And then the day, the following day, so it'd be like 48 hours would be basically like a, a, a light bike ride, like maybe arms or something at the gym and that's it. And then I go for a long run. This year was different and I pushed myself and I failed twice and actually had to call an Uber twice which I wasn't expecting to do, but it didn't really break me down. It didn't really break my confidence because I know I was pushing myself super hard. Like I was trying to run 17 miles like the day after a pretty heavy weight session or even the day after training, you know, five days in a row. My sixth day of training was go out on Saturday and try to run 17 miles just after a half marathon. So I'm trying to extend my distance not allow myself to recover completely, which might have been dumb from some people's points of view, but I liked it because I would literally run until I, my body was like, felt like it was breaking down. I couldn't run. And I was like, you know, I felt just like totally crushed and destroyed. But what happened, I feel like to me was I was able to get a feel for, you know, my threshold, my pain tolerance and my pain threshold, which plays a role when you're running a marathon. I mean, when I when I think about kind of those final few miles, at least for me in a marathon, because I don't run all year, I don't only run. It's a it's basically a mental game too to to not stop after 22 or 23 miles. Um, so for me, I think gaining an advantage of okay, I know that I'm suffering through training, but I really like putting my entire body, my nervous system through quite a bit. Um, I'm not injured, so you know I'm I'm fortunate in that. But I feel like I put myself in a position to not be injured because of how I train, weights, and run, and how I schedule everything. But bottom line is that I failed twice, basically, and where compared to last year, after a half marathon, I didn't fail. But the difference is, like I said, my weight has gone up three to four pounds, and I'm I, I, I feel confident that's like all muscle, pretty much. Like my body fat percentage is still the same, but I've put on muscle, which is the goal of being a hybrid athlete. Any of you guys that are trying to be hybrid athletes should want to dominate in weightlifting, like train like a beast still, you know, like you're, ne you're never going to be like a huge guy. You're never going to be like, you know, 220 and ripped. But, you know, for me, if I can be 195 pounds and still, you know, run a marathon at the pace I'm running, put on another six to seven pounds of muscle, uh, eight, nine, 10 pounds of muscle over the next year or two, that would be awesome. Um, it's it's not easy to do, but I've, I feel like I've accomplished you know, uh, some pretty good weight muscle mass gain over the course of three years of off on off on, you know what I mean? Like six months of weights, but still running and then six months of running, but still weights. So um, I'm happy with her with where I'm at. And, and, and this morning's run was really a big confidence builder for me. Um, you know, and it, it kind of felt me, it gave me the, the desire and the, I felt inclined to basically come on YouTube and basically make this episode for whoever sees it, even if it's five, three, four, five, six people, I think it's still worth it. Cause I've learned a lot about basically just sticking to the plan and not letting these fluctuations kind of affect you. Um, I like watching some podcasts from JJ Reddick because he talks a lot about the NBA um, and he's one of those guys to where he had really had to earn everything that he got. I mean, you look at him, he's what, 6'2", 6'3", white guy, um, not expected to be an all-star in the NBA, not, never expected to have an all-NBA career. But that guy had so many ups and downs. But now he's like one of the top analysts for the NBA. Um, he's well-respected by all of his peers. You know, um, Stephen A. Smith respects him. Um, you know, everyone who he, who he works with around the ESPN, they, they respect him. So, you know, that's the type of guy that basically reports on that stuff at a high, you know, at a professional at an elite level and basically just says the same thing that I'm saying to you right now. 
is like you're going to have plenty of ups and downs, but you don't you don't expect you can you, you expect you don't you don't doesn't necessarily expect from my point of view how those ups and downs are going to come. But you do know and you have the confidence of how you're going to react. So I expect that something's not going to go the way I want. Like there was a on April 6th, I went out for that long run. And I was saying, I'm going to hit 17 miles because I just did a half marathon. You know, I just did a half marathon two weeks ago, had a good training week. I hit the weights hard. Right. But what happened was those all those weight sessions caught up to me and I was still pushing for like, you know, two hour run where I'm not slowing down. I'm hitting seven minute miles and it just wasn't in the books. I literally stopped and I was like, I felt more exhausted after I stopped. Uh, You know, it was only like. 12 miles, I think 11, 12 miles. I felt more exhausted when I stopped then to when I finished my first half marathon this spring on March 24th, like over two weeks ago. So I was in better cardio shape. I was more adapted, but like everything that I pushed myself hard leading up to that. And for me, that was a mental down. Like I felt kind of like discouraged, like, fuck, you know, like I had this whole training session lined up, like, all right, I'm going to hit this big run here. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to basically take a week off and go hit it again the next weekend. But I adapted. Basically, I, what I did was, OK, I failed on that on that Saturday and then I went in on Wednesday. And what happened was I went on Wednesday and I completed uh, 15 and a half miles, almost 16 miles. So that was a win for me because I readjusted my plan, you know, and that's a good life lesson. Is like if you expect to get somewhere, that's really where you where the separation happens between 90 percent of the, pop, the population and those five or 10 percent that are winners in business, winners in life, have good relationships, with their family, their kids respect them. You know, their wife just, you know, appreciates them and they have no major issues in their personal life, professional life, whatever. Fitness is the big teacher of that. And that's a big lesson I learned in this training process this year was, OK, man, you failed like. Not miserably, but you definitely failed on that Sunday, on April 6th. But then you came back. You had another half marathon on the 14th, beat your time by two minutes, went back the following weekend, um, you know, basically trained basically through that. And now you had a couple of good, you know, 18, uh, you know, 18 mile runs to prep for this big, this big marathon. So I know that not allowing myself to ever recover fully during this process of leading up to the full marathon was valuable because I know that I I have this taper week. This is the last thing I'll mention on this episode, but I have this taper week scheduled to where I know that I'm just going to like crush the weights tomorrow on Monday, Tuesday, I'm going to hit another heavy workout, you know, Um, you know, guys like Nick Bear, they'll still, you know, like squat every now and then during a race season or something, or I know he hits a lot of, you know, morning nine mile runs and then might hit weights in the evening. You know, I do kind of like a similar thing. Um, you know, I had my 18 mile run today, so I'm going to hit chest and arms tomorrow, shoulders on Tuesday with maybe some hit cardio, some boxing or something. Um, go Wednesday, hit back. So basically three days to hit pretty much the entire body except for legs because it's, uh, you know, it's race week. Um, but then going to a taper like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, be dedicated to just stopping myself and saying, you have not slowed down this much since your marathon last year. So I have all the confidence in the world that I'm going to be well rested. You know, I'm uh, um, I'm going to be kind of I'm not going to say carved up because I'm pretty much on a keto, more ketogenic diet, which I'll also explain at the end of this um, episode. But um, basically, that's kind of where my mindset's at is I know that the total volume was shortened slightly, but that's due to effort. And that's due to basically just focus on pushing myself as hard as I can, both in weights and in cardio while I'm still trying to do a marathon. So um, I know that I realized that, you know, the outcome is is not going to be as good as it is if I was just running, you know, year round. But I don't want that. I mean, you know, I've made a firm decision for me, like personally, is I want to be a hybrid athlete. Like I want to be kind of, you know, hard to kill in every area, you know, like I want to turn around and I want to start repping 315 on the squat rack, you know, three months from now, four months from now, after I finish my race season, I want to try to bench. I, I topped out at benching like 265 this last year. I want to increase that. I want to hit 275, 285. You know, I want to be able to brag about it, you know, to my son, to whoever, to people who ask me about my fitness. I want to be able to brag about that, you know, and just say, listen, I do both and I can help you, you know, like that's that's kind of the product that I am that I represent is, you know, I've been a consumer of content for a while, but now I'm the, I'm a producer and I can really bring a lot of value to a lot of people who are kind of, you know, in the weeds or kind of just kind of they got one foot in one foot out like, oh, should I do it or not? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty regular day guy. I mean, I, you know, I don't. I make sacrifices, you know, like I eat the same thing all the time, you know, but it doesn't like there's balance. Like, and I did an episode, I think it was episode five or six last year. There's a, there's so much balance and there's so much discipline and and regimen that you can find from, from doing this hard training. Um, But that's, I'll save that for another episode. Um, Last thing I'll touch on, then I'll wrap this up is uh, basically my, my diet has been kind of higher fat, lower carbs. And I feel like I've definitely become fat adapted. 
um, you know, what happens, I won't get into the science of it. That's also for another episode, but, you know, basically I be, I was in, I got into ketosis. I want to say two to three weeks after I started. So that included for me, like bacon with egg whites in the morning, um, peanut butter, uh, a lot of avocados. So high fat, low carb for basically those, those foods that are kind of more of like the energy source, so to speak, like, you know, you want to stay stable with protein intake, no matter what kind of diet you do, it's all about protein. They're the building blocks for everything, obviously. So my protein intake has still been, you know, at least 200 grams of protein, probably two, 215 to 220 um, on this keto diet, just because I also need some calories from, from, uh, you know, protein as well sources, just because I'm so low on carbs, but, you know, the increased fat intake comes from meat, um, you know, 80%, 20%, um, 80, 20 ground beef has really been added in. So, you know, if I eat a whole pound of 80, 20 ground beef, that's got, you know, 800 calories or something. It's got, you know, almost hundred grams of fat, but still, you know, 80, 75, 80 grams of protein, I think. So the profile on that is like ideal. It's optimal for basically, um, getting into ketosis, getting your protein needs, and also getting some of your micronutrients, you know, ground beef is B vitamins, um, zinc, you know, I've still been supplementing on all my micronutrients. Um, anyone who uses my, one of my diet templates can really, you know, kind of, they can be, you know, provide testimony to that, you know, like these programs have all the micronutrients, depending on what, what foods you select, you know, like if, if you're not eating any, um, you know, fish, um, or seafood, like you're going to basically, you're going to need some omega-3 vice versa. If you're all in on chicken, you want to supplement with B12, B6, zinc, magnesium, some of those micronutrients that come from red meat, which is, which is obviously great. But, um, you know, I've been leaning a lot towards red meat, not as much chicken, um, really no fish because it's so lean. It doesn't really do me any good in this keto diet, but yeah, I mean, you know, ground beef, sirloin, um, check roll, poor man's ribeye. Um, that's been a great option for me. So, um, you know, there's, uh, I'll definitely have to do my next episode, episode 21 on, on dieting in this and through this process, because I think that the diet has been a reason higher fat diet has been a reason why a, I feel stronger in my weight workouts and also B, I just have maintained more muscle mass through this process of training for a full marathon. Cause anyone who's done a marathon before knows it's rigorous training. I mean, you can't just make a decision in two weeks, be ready. I mean, it takes me at least a month or two to be ready just due to the fact that I train so hard and, and weightlifting uh, year round pretty much. So um, I think that's been plenty for this episode. Um, definitely talked a lot. Um, but yeah, I hope uh, anyone who sees this gets some value from it. Um, and yeah, no, feel free to reach out, contact me. You know, I got my website, uh, contact me there uh, in the blog or in the chat. Um, you know, contact me here on these videos in the comment section. Um, send me a direct email, uh, nathanielrv91 at gmail.com. Um, that's kind of my, you know, my non, my non-professional professional email, so to speak, not my, not, uh, you know, my email for the company I work for, but my personal professional email. So I'll always see the emails there. So, um, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I uh, hope you got something good out of it and, uh, we'll be looking forward to chatting with you next time. Thanks everyone. Take care.